And in this episode, we're talking all about Bill Jacobson. When I think of Bill Jacobson, Gene just comes to my mind, intellectual, but numbers. Mm -hmm. The last podcast, Chris Everett's birthday is December 20th, not December 21st. I was right. So that was the first time. (laughs) Actually, I'm just teasing. That was the second time. Yeah. So score and stats, I'm up 2-0. Don't be managed by score, be managed by stats. Yep. I think with uh, the great base, we have eight pillars. We've talked about Jim Verdick. We've talked about Welby Van Horn. Now Bill Jacobson. Yeah. Great base, tennis curriculum, tennis pathway. It's not Steve Smith, Andy Fitzell stuff. What Bill brought to the great base uh, was is what he brought to tennis, a pioneer, um, is statistics. Yeah. He designed, uh, we have a copy, or one of the old uh, copy, I guess the instrument, it's not a copy, <laughs> yeah. it's the real thing. Yeah, really, if you're, if, you, if you're listening to this, you could check out on YouTube, we have um, obviously a video, but we have the CT120, the CompuTennis 120, right here on our table. Yeah, we'll get into that. It's a, it's an amazing tool with, and it, it certainly um, has made, a, made an impact on the game, an impact on all of sports. Uh, Den, uh, Dennis Vandermeer of South Africa, and he's one of the other pillars, mm-hmm. uh, one, of, one of the eight, Dennis Vandermeer. Uh, so it's the great base is international. We have two South Africans, Harry Hobbin, Australian, Peter Barosh, a Canadian. Yeah. And then several Americans. With that being said, even though there's only eight pillars in our course, tennis intelligence applies. We have over a hundred coaches, but Bill highly educated. Um, like I think of Jim Verick being so humble. There's things that I learned about Bill Jacobson doing some homework. Um, he completed two four year degrees at the university of Cape town in two years. It's a beautiful place. I was there a couple of years ago. One of our students, Raven Claussen, that's where he's practicing when he's home. Two four-year degrees in two years. Yeah. Uh, he studied business and law. Then he went to Stanford on an academic scholarship, got an MBA. He re- returned home for just a few years, and he started making his home in Northern Cal in the 60s. Basically, he was an intellectual working in a think tank. He worked as a systems engineer for IBM. He's co-founder of a high-tech company called Geometrics. He wrote a book. That's not your typical book of a tennis, of a, of a tennis person. He, uh, tennis contributor, tennis educator. Rediscovery of Africa, 1300 to 1900, geophysical and historical maps. <laughs> With his wife, Yvonne, he, uh, they have funds where they collaborate and are working. There's a, a special program between the uh, University of Cape Town and Stanford. Hmm. So certainly his education, but he matched that by being a tennis player. Yeah. Uh, Played singles and doubles at Wimbledon, 1959. When he played, people played three events. It's interesting. They played three events so they could hang in the tournament as long as possible and get three free meals. Yeah. Because that was back before 1968 when um, the Grand Slams were amateur tournaments. Um, It's amateurism. There was some money under the table, but Mm. not much. Now you try to hold on to your credentials so that you can get free power bars. <laughs> well, it's always interesting. You, you, know, go, you go through your allotment of the day and then you go, hey, I, I got enough for protein bars. That's a that's another conversation. If you're at a Grand Slam. You stock up. You have great food. Yeah. But if you're with someone in the main draw, you're treated a little bit differently if you're coaching someone who's in the qualities. You want money. You get more money for your food, and then if you're, once your player's out, you have 24 hours, and they say you get off the property. Yeah. Um, he, the name of the company, um, from a tennis standpoint, Sports Software Incorporated, but mm. the, the name of the machine, the tool, CompuTennis, 1982, put it together. His son who played tennis. He said his son, like most sons, was not listening to him. Yeah. Um, did he? Initially, he was trying to show his son just how to beat a girl who lived down, down the street from the same neighborhood. But his son was good enough to play at Stanford. Um, now, granted, Bill played you know, at Wimbledon, so mm-hmm. very, very high level. But to me, 
even if you're playing bottom of the lineup at Stanford, that's a really good tennis player. Solid, yeah. Um, now his son's a professor of environmental engineering at Stanford. So Bill is an electrical pioneer of charting, father of modern statistics. So he combined, combined his education, his playing ground, but his colleagues, uh, Tom Whitney, who invented the pocket calculator, also had a significant role in building Apple One. Another colleague, colleague Alan Edberg, had a significant role in building the Apple II computer. Mm. Uh, the price, it was $3,500 in 1982. So, yeah, that's... What could you buy like, with $3,500 yeah. in 1982? What kind of car could you buy? I feel like you, you, you could definitely could, buy a car. You could definitely buy a car. I mean, Nin- you could buy a car for, for that today, but... In 1981... Not a Tesla. Um, I was given the job as a department head of a two-year program, and I was paid $13,000. That was my salary. So, I mean, I certainly made some money teaching tennis in the summer, um, but I was paid $13,000. A side story of that, I have a brother who has a PhD, and if I had a PhD in 1981, I would have been paid $14,000. So I called, called my mother up and said, hey, when you see your, uh, <laughs> your son, my brother Mike, tell him his PhD is worth 1000 bucks." Um, the price never went down. And I think this is uh, very interesting. Unlike the pocket calculator, everybody bought a pocket calculator. Yeah. So the price went way down, just supply and demand. But yeah. I think it really defined the tennis industry. The unit was called CT120, uh, first laptop, and sold less than 200 units. It's amazing. Um, with... I've, several years into it, he developed a PC, a software program for PC computers, so people could chart. I re, I re, don't remember the price, but I remember these numbers uh, could have changed, but only changed slightly. Mm-hmm. Um, is he sold uh, less than eleven hundred software packages? So that's where you could chart on paper, and it was a certain system. Um, Serve, return, key shot, point in the shot, mm-hmm. even user stats. Like if some kid would, after each point, they lose, they hit the racket on the court. You just push with a, with a CT120 on the court, you just push a button. But does you could happen? just, it does happen. <laughs> with, uh, I always think of uh, stories. Mario Cosentino became a very good player in, in, as a junior in Canada. I remember one long tiebreaker, a user stat. 18 times he said, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, Casatino, you're not in church. You don't have to pray. You have to play. Uh, God has bigger problems. People are starving. <laughs> With, um, I remember having the, the computer courtside and people asking me what it was. Yeah. So certainly it was a novelty, to say the least, with so few of them. But we, when the listeners are watching TV, and the camera goes to the team, the, the entourage, the, the booth, the box. Very seldom do you see anybody even taking notes. Yeah. Remember Harold, Harold Solomon was a player, a coach who took notes. Obviously, he was a player, too. Um, I've seen Paul Anacone take notes. But very seldom do you see the, the coach writing anything down. Yeah. Uh, going back to Jim Burdick, he used to say, that get a clipboard and put your brains down. My introduction to Bill was through Dennis Vandermeer and through Vic Braden. And they both had a, a great deal of respect for Bill. Uh, this is fun. I was trained by Eddie Parker. He now owns a club in uh, Virginia. He was on Dennis's staff. Dennis loved Eddie Parker. Like Dennis, he was a great entertainer. I had a lot of fun when Eddie was teaching me how to use Compu Tennis. So he was training you how to use Training me how to use it. Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was great. It made me feel like I was with older brothers or I was in an ice hockey locker room because hmm. he told me he was pretty sure he was a dumb, I was the dumbest person he had ever met. <laughs> um, but Dennis Vandermeer, I was in Tyler, Texas between 81 and 91. And Dennis would come out to Tyler yeah. with his staff and tr- you know, pr- conduct the tennis university program he had and then test um, test our students so they be, would become a professional tennis registry right. member. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, Nike and Dunlop sponsored CompuTennis, hmm. and I was involved with that project and something that should be re, 
brought it right back to the forefront. It was teaching parents how to chart. Yeah, that'd be big time. Uh, Carlos Goffey was part of that. Um, his son coaches at the University of South Carolina, but Carlos ran t- camps called Tournament Tough. He had a book called Tournament Tough. Yeah, good book. We used his book uh, in a class called Contemporary Literature for Tennis Instruction. In Port Washington, Carlos, uh, he he worked uh, for Harry Hopman. Great guy, great in front of a group. He worked with the McEnroe's. So Bill Jacobson really liked one of Carlos Goffey's concepts, red light, green light, yellow light. And it's when you're ahead in the points, behind in the points, or even. Yeah. So for an example, um, a green light point when, would be when you're ahead by two or more points. It's not just when you're serving, it's when you're returning. So it could be 40 love, love 40. Yeah. 30 love, love 30. And the math is on your side to take a risk. For example, Roger, uh, let's go say ahead. Roger Federer and Wimbledon, 40, 15, two championship points. Yeah, he should have gone forward. Yep. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about Roger with stats. Um, but, it, you know, it's like who can second guess Sir Roger? Um, you definitely yeah. being an armchair, armchair quarterback. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure if he could relive that, he would play those points differently. Yeah. Like, for, a, for example, a 12 year old, if they knew early on, their coach knew, their parents knew, I think what happens at that age, everybody wants to win. The, the player obviously wants to win. The parent of the player wants mm. to, parents want the player to win, and the coach wants the player to win. Yeah. But a 12 year old should, they're up 40 love is, okay, I'm going to serve volley. Hit the serve to the middle because you don't want to angle begets an angle, give them um, options to pass you. But if a player started doing that, they're up 40 love and they serve and volley. I think someone could go through their whole 12 and under time, a two year span, and no one would even know, hey, when they're up <laughs> yeah. up by three, you know, they're going to they're they're serve and volley. Um, so these, I remember, uh, helping out with these clinics. Uh, one, for example, was at T bar M in Dallas and Peter Fleming, they would also have a touring pro come. Hmm. Um, but I think it's a great concept. Now, not necessarily all, all parents would want to learn how to chart, but um, I think parents, they need to have the numbers. So you see, you, you hear a, you hear a, say, let's pick on a dad for a minute. Dad is talking about his son's tournament. And he's telling the story and, oh, he double faulted 11 times. Mm-hmm. They start telling the story after the tournament on Monday. And by the end of the week, he goes, yeah, he double faulted at least 21 times. <laughs> uh, so, Tall tales. Um, when I hear parents say, well, they double faulted 11 times, where are you going? That's one. That's two. <laughs> that's three. Mm-hmm. Um, this program we had where you get a degree in tennis, we had seven certifications very quickly. There were the USPTA. PTR, NTRP, USRSA, umpire, CPR, and then the last one I listed here was CompuTennis. USPTA, United States Professional Tennis Association for Teachers, Professional Tennis Registry, registry the same. NTRP, National Tennis Rating Program. So you have the people are familiar with that, the 3 0 leagues, the 3 5 leagues. Right. You used to have to be certified. It wasn't self rating years ago. You used to have to go to a clinic and be trained. USRSA is for stringing. You had to be certified. Right. Umpires go through the course. Actually, it was CPR. It's amazing to me now. Years ago, you ha- it was annual. You had to go through the CPR training. Yeah. But with CompuTennis, um, our degree program member, Steve Aberson, who was an employee, bright guy, he went to Duke and Stanford. Um, he conducted the workshop. Hmm. Um, a few more things on the laptop. Um, it weighs four pounds. So it had a shoulder bag mm-hmm. and this right here is the screen. This could help you block the sun. It has directions on it. Um, with there's three screens. There's three ways to give out information. So here's the LCD screen. Yeah. Now I used to just carry this like a clipboard and push buttons. And this is a grocery, like a grocery receipt. Yeah. A little so print out. A little print out. So if somebody, they play tiebreaker and you go, Boom, and it's right there, Johnny and Spot. You give that to the kid, and then you go on and you can chart another tiebreaker. Pretty cool. So 
that's because that was referred to as the internal printer. The external printer, that was like carrying, uh, so you had the shoulder bag and then you had like a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very easy to get 25 pages per set. Wow. You know, uh, even the point where it was written out, you could just read your forehand, <laughs> your opponent, or your, your player's forehand, or, or better yet, it would be going back to your player one. You see the two different button, buttons from the top, so you can do doubles as well. So yeah. singles is player one, um, player two, and then you for doubles, you'd have both player one. Um, you see it right here, the two buttons, yep. player one, player two, um, for doubles. The... Um, I traveled with Computex. This is an interesting story. The trip was indoors. Doug McCurdy, an American, he at one time was a director of development for the ITF. And I went to Moscow to study tennis, went to Prague. And when I went to Russia and went through border control, right before my eyes, they took it apart and put it back together. Gosh. It was like, for me, a scene from a movie. <laughs> um, I purchased my first... CT 120 in 1985 and used it through 2000. But then with Y2K, it's amazing. Um, there was, it really, it was as if it discontinued or malfunctioned um, at that point. Could you um, buy one? I mean, it was still available even though there was only 200 sold. I mean, well, it came out in 82 and I certainly um, was already trained um, through the certification program. With, um, uh, let me back up on that at 82. I wasn't trained on the certification program because that, that didn't start initially. But I was um, exposed to it right away because mm -hmm. Dennis, uh, Vic Braden used to have, you know, Vic Braden and Dennis Vander. Dennis Vander used to have the symposium. And then Bill was always at the symposium. Mm -hmm. And I used to be a permanent fixture at, at functions like that back at that time. And Vic had the United States Tennis Academy. Yeah. It was before when the USTA was the USTA. USLTA. Yeah. United States Law and Tennis Association. So that's where I um first was trained in a you know where you know he Bill would be a say a lecturer at the PTR or presenter and then he was part of the of Vic's program for coaches for several years. But the cost of it, so um, I tried to have the school say, okay, we'll put it in the budget. It was turned down. Mm -hmm. Then I had two wealthy students who showed up, and they had bought one. And they presented to me, and I was like, it's like they were showing me gold. <laughs> and I said, that's great. You'll be able to help us out so much. Let me meet with you two guys. So I met with them, and they said, well, what are you going to pay us? Yeah. And I go, I mean, we here. used to use the worst tennis balls. You think the ones we use now are bad? <laughs> we had no money for this budget. Actually, the president of the college, his monthly budget for social functions was the same as our yearly budget. So anyway, once these guys told me that they were going to charge me, I said, okay. And I bought one. Just bought one for the program out of my own funds. Gave I, a lot of blood. Hmm? Gave a lot of blood. With uh, gave a lot of blood. No, I, I found found thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah, actually, I had two at one time. Uh, the second one was really a loner because a general manager that we worked with of a tennis club had bought one, and then his coaches weren't using it. And then wasn't too. We had it a few years where he had two, and then he um, he hired one of our coaches, and and the coach. Now, um, our loaner went back to the to the owner. It's interesting now. It makes me think of PlaySite, <clears throat> where that's, you know, I think $10,000 for a PlaySite. Yeah. And a lot of the college campuses, I mean, I've been on where the team's like, oh, you got PlaySite. Yeah, we never use it. <laughs> with with PlaySite. Um, it's a great. It, you know, one great. thing with, with CompuTennis, too, and I'll talk about Bill Jacobs' numbers and Vic Braden's numbers, is... PlaySight is an amazing tool, but it, it's still not going to tell you the numbers for grip, swing, body. Right. You know, those, to me, that's, talk about analytics. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. That's the first thing you need. Yeah. Um, with, continue through my notes here. Um, CompuTennis, when it comes down to it, it really made its impact through television. 
Um, you know, granted, um, teaching aids, for example, very few teaching aids are purchased. I think most tennis teachers, unfortunately, they just have their ball basket. They're, they're not buying teaching aids. With our program, uh, covered, covered the pro tournaments that were in Texas at that time. Um, Craig Tiley, whose name comes up quite a bit, he was with us for so many years. I can remember that he used to be able to chart on two two laptops at one time. Mm. And because he, he did he did more off court work for us than on court work. Uh, but you know, sharp, sharp guy. Mm. Um Craig and a few others, um when they would work for T V, they would sit right next to the booth and then, you know, they would um they could take it just from the stats from this internal printer yeah. and and just click it off. But also, too, is that during a commercial, um, they could just from the LCD screen, just take a three by five card and write down. So they, they were giving out some numbers. Yeah, real time stats. I mean, it's huge for any commentator. Nowadays, they do it so easily with, you know, all the uh, Hawkeye systems and everything. They can get trajectories yeah. and ball speeds and all the stats. But no, Craig is this now is the beginning right here. He's the CEO of Tennis Australia. He's the director of the tournament and. Um, it's applauded, uh, commended for being the most high tech of the four majors, but really, uh, and I understand that, you know, Tennis Australia has developed a- at least one new app, but they are doing many things um, on the technological side to present numbers to both uh, the players, the coaches, yeah. um, however, to help out through through the media and that, that it all goes back to Bill Jacobson. Yeah. Leo Levin, Leo Levin, let me pronounce that correct. One, two, three, ten, eleven. 10, 11. <laughs> he was an employee of Bill's. He was right there on the ground level for floor. I remember uh, calling him. I'm saying here he just passed away recently. Yeah, right? young too, 62. Um, Northern Cal, and, and that's where Bill's based out of. That's where CompuTennis was founded. Uh, Levin was loved by all the commentators. He actually was a college teammate at Gilbert's. He started working with Compu Tennis, um, but he had the schedule to work full time TV. Where Bill, um, this was like a, a hobby, yeah, labor of love, yeah. Um, so then he, uh, I'd say, you say, say, he broke off from Compu Tennis. He worked independently as a consultant. He was the first employee uh, for a company that's called now, it was all, once called IDS, but now it's SMT, the um, sports media technology. Mm. He was the first employee or longest tenured employee. Mm. Um, but again, just highly respected. And I think, again, you know, Bill Jacobson, uh, he's in the, the Hall of Fame in Northern Cal. To me, I think he should be in the International Hall of Fame. It comes down to yeah to really know a subject you need to know the history yeah and he is the 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 father of modern stats right with um on terms and numbers so i think there you know we refer to it as uh jacobson's language mm-hmm. i think of jack kramer's uh high school geometry teacher you know he's given credit for popularizing the term percentage tennis right but a language would be the balls hit three ways. And it's not underspin or slice, top spin, flat. It's plus minus IP. And I know you and I are, are you know, Braden Knights, for example. I think that people really study Vic Braden information and then you start to, you know, apply Vic Braden information. It's almost like you, you can learn more away from the master or the mentor when you're just out in the field working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, so again, terminology plus minus IP. The balls hit three ways. Plus is strong, and minus is weak, and an IP, IP is in play or neutral. So oh, yeah. when you, you know, you're out there telling young kids are playing very quickly, you don't want to break the flow of play. Say he hits a minus, you hit a minus minus. Yeah. When they hit a minus, you need to step up and hit a plus. It's really interesting. Like when one kid slices, the other kid slices. So they hit a minus, so you're going to hit a minus. It simplifies it, and it also gives it a different kind of spin. Oh, like. Weak, strong, you know, it's just an easy way. I think it's 
Pretty yeah, and you know that's you clear. work on technique. So there's times where you, you want to hit an IP. You've got to neutralize out of the corner, just absorb pace, float the ball back, um, hit an off pace shot. Um, but for sure, though, and I think it's a way to people to motivate people technically. Mm-hmm. You know, you really need to work on technique so you have tactics. Um, it's the when it comes down to Bill Jacobs and tennis math, we have. Uh, the first, we talked about that in a previous podcast. The first S, self-management. The second S is strokes. Third, strategy. Fourth, stats. Five, score. Yeah. And people forget one through four and they just want to win. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. The point ends three ways. Plus, plus is a winner. Minus, minus is a unforced error. Minus F is a forced error. And these buttons were all on the machine, right? That terminology. Yeah. 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 So we tell players that are... Um, you know, learning to chart with just pen and paper, you can create your own symbols. Yeah. You know, F-H-A-V, and you would see that here, forehand volley, F-H-A-G. Yeah. Forehand ground stroke. Yeah. Um, you know, when it comes down to... You can use CC, cross court. Yeah, DL down the line. Yeah. And, you know, you have to think of lowercase, uppercase. So say, for example, you have um, R for return, and you have R for red zone. Um, yeah. On the... Uh, this right here is this uses a shield for the sun, but it just tells you right here about um, the zones of the court. You know where was the where was where was the where did you miss from? Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you chart your player by using the computer, you get stats for the other player. Yeah. A mathematical formula. When I write this on the board, it makes me feel like a professor. <laughs> um, off of Bill Jacobson's. CT120, we created, you know, from his creation, a, a T chart. It's a very simple way for kids to chart. Yeah. Now, I remember Bill in, in lecture formats or people who worked for him, Steve Abramson, Leo Levin, where Pepsi versus Coca Cola. I have a sister who used to be on the corporate side of Pepsi. Well, um, market share. There is RC Cola, but just think, okay, there's just Pepsi and Coca-Cola. So there's, they're fighting for a hundred percent of the market share. Uh, Harry Hopman, it's a hundred dollars. Where, 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 where's the, where's the money going to go? Yeah. And so you have a T chart for both players and there's a plus column and a minus column. And what goes in the plus column is your winners. And what goes in your minus column is your unforced errors. Where you, when we do a T chart, where you put the uh, forced air is you put it in the minus column of the person who missed, but yeah. you circle it. You circle it, yeah. Because it counts as a positive. For the other player. Uh, for Yeah, for the other player. Yeah. I think uh, just defining the unforced air. First of all, in charting, if you use a computer and I use a computer, it depends on how you, how you gauge an unforced error. Some people are a little bit more um, lenient. It's, oh, that was an unforced error. Yeah, and yeah. It's like, no, I don't think so. It was just a, <laughs> a, it was a serve that was to the middle. It was in play, and they just missed it. Yeah. It's a minus minus because they weren't, they weren't pressured to move. I can remember in the classroom is uh, Bill Jacobs had just taken an eraser. Well, if I'm going to toss the eraser to you from the blackboard. Mm-hmm. And I taught it, hit you right in the hands and you dropped it. <laughs> that, is, that is an unforced error. Yeah, that's where it can be a little bit subjective, but. But then you take the racer and you throw it across the room and the kids got to dive for it. Yeah. That's you're applying pressure. Yeah. So you end up with a plus minus. So what goes into your plus column? You're going to win points through winners and they're through applying pressure, mm-hmm. forced errors. And then really think about the, the unforced column, excuse me, the, the minus column. It's your unforced errors. Right. So then what's your plus minus? So generally a kid will know. I know you took a player to the tournament today, got to the finals, he lost three and three. Um, if you know Bill Jacobson's input, his contribution to tennis, you have a very good chance of having that kid be able to turn that match around, plays him, plays him next week. Yeah. It was interesting too, the, the player uh, that he lost to, in his, in his mid twenties, probably from Argentina, his girlfriend was there watching, and I had, I had a couple other of our players. One that was going to play doubles later, another one that's got a, a bad toe, 
So he, he, they both came to chart. So they're, I had them charting. And so these guys are scribbling, you know, writing, writing, writing all the, the T charts. And the girlfriend came up to me after she goes, what are you, what were you guys doing over there? You know, and I go, Oh, and we're talking and she's from France. And I just showed her, you know, this is a T chart and went through the whole thing. And she was like, man, that's really cool. You know? So it's unfortunate that these basic kind of things aren't seen all the time. Yeah. You know, that, that was something so new to her because she, well, it's like that Here article. Be uh, we'll you've been familiar with tennis. And yeah, we'll talk about Vic Braden, uh, May 10th, 1976, Sports Illustrated. An article about Vic, tennis is in the Stone Ages. Yeah. Still is. Yeah. You know, because people are not getting objective information. Yeah. You play a match, I should say you chart a match to get objective data on, on what to practice. Yeah. But that, that, you know, that kind of brings up, you know, for a parent, for a girlfriend, for a friend, it's able to go and watch somebody play. It's like, hey, teach those people how to chart. You know, if you're the player, it's like if you're smart, hey, will you chart my first serve percentage or how many? You know, yeah, I mean, just if get some information. We, again, we we talked about Bill, uh, excuse me, Jim Verdick. Um, through my education with Jim Verdick, I would not, if I was a college coach, I would not have my number seven and eight. Yeah. They're traveling. They're not lined up, just yeah, clapping hands. Sure, yeah, sure. It's like with the the NFL, it's amazing how many great coaches were second string quarterbacks. And where's the second string quarterback during the game? They're wearing a headset like this. Yeah. They're standing right next to the court, right. the coach, the coach, and they're carrying a clipboard. Uh, it's kind of like in ice hockey. A lot of goalies became very good coaches because, especially backup goalies, they're just they're just there every day watching the whole thing. Yeah, and you know, even the goalie who's on the ice, you know, they see everything in front of them. Yep. Um, not to digress, but when I was a kid, there was no goalie coaches. They were just, hey, go get in the net. <laughs> but a, a lot of times they, they ended up uh, knowing the most because they were just a silent observer to the Watch whole thing. Out, you don't get killed. Uh, more on Jacobson's this language. What was the key shot? It, with most kids, it's you hit short. Yeah, exactly. The kid method, KID, keep it deep. Yeah. Height equals depth. Yeah. Um, the point ending shot, it's interesting. You can have... Really young kids, all we want you to do is sit here, number the point, and what was the, how did the point end? Mm -hmm. You know, it could be player one or player two, and just so it, could, it would be something like this: it would be player one. Just have to just write this down. Player one, number one. First of all, first point. Player one, FH forehand ground stroke. What zone? Red zone. And you could even put like the the defensive area of the red zone because yeah. they're too far back. So. Yeah. Um, DRZ. once they start doing it, um, you know, it might be lowercase D cause you're going to use uppercase D for double fault. Mm. You know, so can they read their own writing? Can they read their own hieroglyphics? And, yeah. and then did the point end? And it's, is there's so many minus minuses, very little tennis played in tennis, a, a tragedy, a comedy of errors. And it's like, it, we say this all the time. Um, when crummy plays crummier, who wins? Crummy wins, but Crummy doesn't know they're Crummy. Mm -hmm. You know, so Crummy made thirty-five percent on forced errors. Crummier made fifty, mm -hmm. and no telling what happened on the other fifteen. Well, the thing is, too, visually, when you look at a T chart, you can just get a snapshot because the unforced errors are on the right, the winners are on the left, and of course, the circled. But basically, you see, oh, okay, this player won because you just see they've got more unforced errors on the right-hand column than the other one. Yeah, serve indicator, it's so important. You know, I know you, you've been on the tour with players. Generally, they can hit serves two pluses. Yeah. You know, you get to a real high level, the second serve is not an IP. Like in junior tennis, many times the second serve is always a minus. So yeah. you actually could play an approach shot on every second ball. serve. Yeah. And then, yeah, it has to it has to land before the service line. So it's it's a short ball. Yeah. I remember Jennifer Capriati, obviously great ball striker, made a comeback and won Grand Slam titles, mm -hmm. lots of positives. But she was playing Dementi Avia, uh, who was a gold medalist. Yeah. You know, she never, I, to my knowledge, I have to go back and check the books. I, um, amateur tennis historian, no Bud Collins. Mm -hmm. She didn't win a Grand Slam, is what I would say, but she won a gold medal. So she's serving in, four, in the 40s, 40 MPH. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like, I'm just going to play an approach shot and come in. But Jennifer was just, and a lot of times what happens is people are really early. Um, 
Yeah. It's like Francois Durer from France years ago. Up. She served like, she, she looked like, she was top 10 player in the world. She looked like she was playing three, five lady doubles and palm up. And But back in those days, a lot of the players had continental grip on both sides and the rack face was open. So the men in mixed doubles, they'd have a really tough time. Her serve is coming so slow. And it's like a knuckleball. Yeah. The best baseball, baseball players will say, hey, they have a little tough, they have a tough time with a knuckleball. Yeah. What was the line that Vic would, Vic Braden would say about Francois? Well, she hit her backhand with a forehand grip. So if you don't change your grip, you have to change your wrist. So her wrist was totally collapsed like this. And he would demonstrate. He was so funny. He'd say, if you can use any grip you want. And he'd say, you can shoot it out of your armpit if you want. But he said, Francois Dur, she hits it like this. But you have to remember, she could choke a bull, she could choke a bull with two fingers. <laughs> yeah, but that. he'd be so animated when he said it. He'd say, offense, defense, neutral, differential. You know, it's, it's amazing like to watch Federer, how he can transition. He's on defense, but the next thing you know, he's on offense. Yeah. Like so many kids today, they'll have an extreme grip on the on the forehand side. The only grip they attempt is hit a TV topspin lob. It's like seniors, they know how to hit underspin defensive lobs. Just mm-hmm. get them off the net, mm-hmm. make them hit the overhead, Yeah. and then try to counter. And We do drill all the time. We feed the ball up, let it bounce, hit the overhead right up the middle, and you should be able to take that with a short compact swing and just yeah. rip topspin rip right at them. Yeah. So now they're up at the net. And the racket's open because the ball's below the level net. Yeah. Aggressive air margin. I love this from Jacobson. Is that, you know, this is fantastic. If you could win two out of three at the net, we always tell people in school that's a D, 66%. Yeah. But in tennis, that's an A. Right. Because two out of three turns to four out of six, eight out of 12, 16 out of 24. And through all of tennis, people don't know that. Number one reason people don't go to the net is they don't go to the net. Have athletes about computer, they're not programmed. Yeah. And um, like Roger Federer says, a lot of really good things happen at the net. One, if you win two out of three consecutively, you win 6 0. 6 0, 6 0. With this is a, interesting. I just go six points played and just hold up my fingers. So player A has won four points, player B has won two points. If you can get 17% better, now the match is dead even. You get beat 6 0 6 0 because, you know, you just say, okay, I'm going to take one finger here and one yeah. finger here. And now I have three and three. Yeah. Um, you know, here's something what happens to the defensive specialists? A lot of 12 and under players, they, they've, they fall out of sight. No one ever hears about them anymore because they have the mentality that they want to try to win 100% of the points, mm. the human backboard. And we always tell, uh, juniors, oh, I played a pusher. I hate playing pushers. <laughs> you know, um, I think of Borg and Nadal being more defensive specialists, you know, and, and that's not to say that they don't all of a sudden convert that into offense. They just are not giving you anything. Yeah. The human backboards. Yeah. So if a kid is trying to get 100% and now they come and they um, play against someone who's more of a risk taker, and that risk taker is up at 66%, even if they're only at 51%, but 66%, and then that that fades away. So that's where we tell people, and this comes from Jacobs, and so many things that we say is the player who misses the most overheads, 12 and under is the player who misses the most overheads. Yeah. Out of 12 and under, it was uh, Bud Schultz, Bud Schultz's son, Christo. He spent uh, quite a bit of time with us, and we sent him to the National 12s. Um, it was a project through through Harvard. You know, that's where he was going to school. And we had him film incognito, 50 boys, 50 girls from, from behind. So they're serving their forehand. Yeah. But, and he had a group of people helping him out. It doesn't take long to say, okay, all we want to know is if the point ended with an overhead. So you, you got you know four people around the tournament and it's just, okay, you watch a point and you're just going one, and two, three, oh. use the tally system. But they had to chart a thousand points. There was only seven overheads hit. Not too many. Not too many. Yep. Well, it's like we said from the beginning, young players go to the net to lose at a faster rate. And they want to win. They want to get the two inch trophy. Yeah, they don't have the wingspan and they're very easy to not so therefore pass and they yeah. uh, you get you can lob them uh, as well. So um, 12 and unders, according to Jacobson's data, 
Um, and it's all fact based. It's not like according to his opinion. Yeah. Uh, and then 55 and over, those are defensive games. Everything else is in between. So you need to identify yourself with the word aggressive, like Steffi Graf, mm. Andre Agassi were offensive baseliners. Sampras and Ratzelova were offensive net rushers. You know, when people get to a really high level, they're not a, a defensive push. Yeah. Um, fed at the French. I used to write for a magazine, Tennis Life. Mm. Wrote an article, Dear Mr. Roger Federer, Sir. Mm. So he played against Nadal. And at the end of the match, he had come to the net 17, 17% of the points. And he won 73. Yeah. So Las Vegas is going to say, Roger, you need to go in more. Yeah. The bookie, um, the person with some street smarts. Actually, v one time made some negative comments about Fetter. But it was taken out of context because the beginning of the interview, he said, there's no one that I've ever enjoyed watching more than Fetter. The way he moves, the way he plays, he just was singing his praises. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's somebody who, you know, spent a lot of years with Vlander playing with Edberg, Davis Cup teammates. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can talk more about Federer in my notes here, 2017, what happened to him as far as going forward. But you want to be managed by stats, not managed by score. You know, stubbornness, great champions are stubborn. And we talked about it before in these podcasts where Federer, he would run around his <laughs> back in his forehand in the doll's lefty yeah, forehand, forehand or then in the Djokovic miraculous backhand. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, basically he was saying is I believe in my forehand more than I believe in my volleys. Mm. And I think I can beat you this way. I've beat you this way before. Um, Bob Hewitt, South African, um, very, very successful tennis player. Unfortunately, house arrest now, he's he got in trouble. He was in the Hall of Fame, and now he's dropped from the Hall of Fame. But he didn't believe in an unforced error. It's like, if you get your racket on it, it should get you, you should, should get it. the ball back. It's kind of like a football coach saying, if you get your hands on the ball, you need to catch the yeah, ball. Yeah. Um, so again, that comes back to the judgment. So he would be harsh. With, um, you know, again, many people are too lenient. Yeah. So that's where you want to be consistent. Yeah. Uh, mutual friend of ours, Warren Pretorius, with Dartfish. Mm -hmm. um, he was at our place when a workshop one time speaking to a group of coaches. And he said, I remember that. He said, what we're doing with Dartfish is the same thing Braden was doing 30 years ago. But I think one thing to mention with Warren, and we'll get him on here as a guest, is tagging matches. Yeah. What's said about children today is that they're not going to relate so much to pencil and paper or a, a printout mm -hmm. text where they have to read it. So say, for example, if someone misses 19 forehands, that you just show them. Yeah. You know, and you can do that. Um, one thing about college coaches, and, um, you know, Warren will provide a service for universities or uh, their matches are streamed, their matches are filmed, and then he has people who chart those matches. Yeah, tennis analytics. Because they're so, because uh, college students are so busy and they're limited to 21 hours a week, I think it is, uh, 20, 21 hours a week. I think it's 21 hours a week for 21 weeks. Um, but they actually just, to look at the charts. But if you could just, you know, like how long does it take you to just show someone, you know, yeah. point 0.17, point yeah. 0.22, point, you know. Right. 27, forehand miss, forehand miss. And then where they miss them. Yeah. And when you think about the graphics on TV, and we do this with young kids in a piece of paper, okay, just write down, you know, say they're missing forehands, FHHG, or on the other side, BHG, backhand ground strokes. And you draw, you do it on a diagram of a tennis court. You just take a piece of paper like this. Yeah. And then when, when the air is made, just draw to where the air was made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can have really young kids do that. Yeah. Missed a forehand, where did they miss? And they're only going to miss one of four places. Yeah. About 50 points played in a, set, in a set, about five patterns of points. And what are those patterns? You know, the parents hang in there as their duty to watch a, a match from beginning to end. And certainly there's drama 
towards the end who's going to win this match, especially when the matches are really close. Mm. But for the most part, um, it's really the same tennis throughout. Yeah. You know, if they're making the same mistakes over and over again. Yeah. Um, so many creative ways to, to chart simply. Uh, you know, I've used obviously all the different ways we chart on paper. And then Dartfish, I've used their tagging, and you can do it from a phone, you can do it from a tablet. But, but there is, you know, it is kind of nice just to do it by hand, and you can add notes as well. So it's great to use technology, and, and Dartfish is awesome with, with video, too, attaching it to it. But also, it's just great to, to learn how to do it by hand as well. I've read where if someone writes something, they have a better chance of remembering it than if they just punch a button on yeah. their phone or their computer. Yeah. Um, we talked about the most important numbers being grip, swing, body, mm-hmm. but also to number of hours practiced. You know, you got to be a myelin farmer. Yeah, I love it. The substance the brain produces, and yeah. it's like, hey, good myelin. Yeah. Uh, coming back to uh, good crop or bad crop of myelin. You know, deprogram, reprogramming, unlearning, relearning. But when it comes down to uh, behavioral patterns, it, Roger Federer. I, I'd love to quote Roger Federer. I didn't know you were supposed to win in practice. Mm-hmm. Kids are so outcome oriented. The ego kills. It's like serve and volley. It's practice. Yeah. You know, crack a plus. Yeah. You know, don't back up, hit off your back foot and hit a minus. I think and, the same thing is true. Even at the highest levels of game on the tour, a lot of times it's like, hey, I want to win this practice set. And it's like their confidence depends on it, you know, instead of having that like, okay, I'm playing so-and-so and, I need to work on attacking the backhand. Yeah. But maybe the guy you're practicing practicing with has an amazing backhand, but you still got to practice that. Well, also, too, there's a lot to be said. That's why people, um, it's like in in the Midwest, you know, they used to call it the Westerns, really strong tournaments. Amazing how many tennis players came out of the Midwest before the advent of the academy. And now everybody's got to leave the Midwest and get to Florida, get to California. Mm Um, and that's not necessarily true. Um, you just think about, you know, you know, granted, like say an Andre Yeager from Illinois and then before her, a, a Jimmy Connors from Illinois. Um, yeah, when you're just, you know, beating everybody in the entire state, you know, you're a junior and you're beating the seniors. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then you have to seek out, um, a higher level of competition, mm. but the private lesson as well is that where more sets were played. I always ask when I'm on a college campus, can the, 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 it's a tough term, the worst, can the worst boy on the boys team yeah. play and beat the best girl? And usually that match never happens because of Macho Mill Ego. Mm. There's just not enough tennis played. It's amazing. Say in a um, high school uh, tennis team, two girls playing one and two, they're very good. And you say, they should be playing a set a day. Mm. It's like, um, you always talk about the story between uh, Brian Godfrey and Dick Stockton being at uh, Trinity, their roommates, and they just had a lined piece of paper on the door, and you know how many who won the set, one set a day. Yeah. How, yeah. how clever is that? Play one set a day. Yeah. And they both played each other in the NCAA finals, and they both became top ten in the world. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, Braden and, and Jacobs are both kind souls. Um, I discussed many times with Bill how Vic was misinterpreted. Mm. You know, Uncle Vic, the entertainer, the comedian, he was really known for his presentation, yeah. not his information. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a, um, a session on Vic. I think sometimes um, we, we say, you know, he'll say something that's really funny, and then he also said something that's really, really important with tennis information, and people miss it because they're, they're laughing. <laughs> yeah, we talk about Braden numbers and Jacobson numbers. For me, um, 1975, Vic made a, um, produced a film, mm. Go for Winter, on mixed doubles, but it's really doubles. Yeah, it's awesome. Fantastic adventure. And it was done, it was made one take, but I volunteered over two days to show it for the Boca Raton Tennis Association in the mall. And if I, if I didn't volunteer for that task, I think I would have been like everybody else. Go, oh, this guy's funny. This guy's funny. But when you just listen to all the information, yeah. um, but there was so much behind uh, the numbers. 
um, with with Vic, and, and Bill knew that. In other words, angle the racket face, angle the racket path. Well, the racket face is open on, say, the backhand volley, and the racket path is going downward, so mm-hmm. the player's not closing in. Yeah. And they're, because of that, Jacobson's terms, the backhand volley's a minus. You know, the everyday terms in tennis, they didn't stick the backhand volley. Mm-hmm. Here's some other things in my notes. Uh, Scotty Perelman uh, from Monroe, Michigan, hometown of Vic Braden. Mm-hmm. He, um, I worked with Scotty. when He's at Florida now. He's one of the coaches on the men's team. Um, I worked with him on Vic's staff in California. And then at one point, uh, Scotty Perlman was at the University of Tennessee. And he, from there, he started coaching Chris Woodruff on the tour. And I remember being at the Canadian Open. And unfortunately, Woodruff got injured, but we were, um, I was with Richard Hernandez, who runs a club very close to the Canadian Open in New York, mm-hmm. Ontario. And um, he was playing with Kelly Jones. Mm-hmm. And it was right before Kelly became a national coach of the USTA. And I remember Kelly asking me, what the device was. So my point with that is uh, you know, only 200 units sold, yeah. even world-class tennis players, Kelly Jones became number one in the world in doubles. Mm-hmm. They didn't know it was. Yeah. Um, Alvin Poloni, um, his father, he's the only parent that I knew that had a CT 120. So you'd go to junior tournaments mm. and I remember just calling him up on the phone and talking to him um, and his son, he played at Georgia. He transferred to Boise State, so he became a very good tennis player. Uh, another person to think of uh, stats is Craig O'Shaughnessy. Mm-hmm. You know, he's doing a great service for tennis. Uh, he's had, uh, I would say, some TV exposure. I don't think that he's a permanent fixture uh, mm-hmm. with with matches. You know, he's been hired, done, done work for Djokovic. Uh, and he... You know, has I think he's been given, given credit for this one. It's so popular, serve plus one, mm. or first four shots. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then that's misinterpreted. I think if you get on YouTube and listen to Craig O'Shaughnessy, he's an Aussie. He's been tennis his whole life. He actually played college tennis with someone I coached a long time ago. Uh, I was good friends with Kim Whitberg, and Kim sent me his younger brother, Scott. Right. And they, they both played college tennis together, together Craig and... Scott, but with, you know, O'Shaughnessy would know, hey, little kids need to learn how to rally. Yeah. Um, I don't think when, when little kids are hearing serve plus one, so, you know, they're throwing the ball over their head, they're arching their back, they're, you know, they think it's a kick serve and then they're just, they've got an extreme Western grip and then they're trying to grip and rip. <laughs> um, actually, that was uh, Craig's uh, connection with Dustin Brown Dustin Brown was taught by the Wittenbergs. Right. Uh, he's from Jamaica, but he, bars he now is in Germany. Um, he beat Nadal at Wimbledon. And I think for me, that goes back to, okay, the, the, the Kim Wittenberg was at one time a Vic Braden coach. Forward, 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 force. Yeah. That's a, that's part of uh, Jacobson's vocabulary is you got to force, you got to yeah. be offensive, you got to pressure players. Um, but so Craig worked for Kim and Kim worked for Braden. The, f- the first match I ever charted. Yeah. I was going to ask you that. I saw that. was, uh, Clayton Stanley, who was the first Guinea pig at Tyler junior college's tennis tech program. And he ended up going to Texas and he was a lineup player at Texas and he played Ryan Simi. And I remember Ryan Simi, his father played baseball where I played hockey college and you charted using the ct oh yeah 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 the first first match i ever charted and, and clayton got beat love and one we bright guy you know young age was um um so he's born in 74 82 i got i got 85 so it's been uh what 14s uh 74 85 no it, it would have been 12s mm-hmm. so they were young kids and um it was just within the same month clayton went from getting just one game to getting 10 because his confidence was he, he didn't get shell-shocked. Um, you know, he was a good player. He was a good player. Seemed a little bit better. It was just at that time baseline to baseline pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember that making a big difference. Um, the, st- the stats, you mean? 
Yeah, so you can sit sit down and go, yeah, okay, this is how the score works. Yeah. I remember one year it was at Wimbledon where Robin Sorderling he plays Federer. He loses in straight sets. But the diff- as far as point difference, it was seven. Yeah. And the commentator as well, it was an easy match. It was a routine <laughs> match. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so the scoring system is very, very deceiving. I think yeah. that um, going back to if you can just get one point better out of six, yeah. you can go from being beat six, love, six, love to – the match is dead even. Right. Um, I was working at the Robbie Seguzo Carling Bassett Tennis Academy. I was a director, first director. And, you know, shortly afterwards, not, you know, within two years, it was sold to uh, Chris Everett. But I charted Vince Spadia. He won the Orange Bowl. Vince Spadia. Ain't afraid of you. Yeah. So, he got to be 19 in the world, so he was a very good tennis player. He didn't win an ATP title till he was 29. Mm. Now, again, Robbie, who was coaching him, and I worked for Robbie. You know, it's, Vince was a very good tennis player before the academy started. Yeah. Um, so he got to be 19 in the world, but he also he lost um, 19 times in the first round. But the, the big difference with juniors and pros – is in forcing. a row, in a row, 19 times. I mean, it was yeah. like the longest yeah. streak. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm in there. But, I mean, just to be on the ATP tour is that I've coached a lot of kids that have been top 10 in the NCAs, and they haven't played five matches on the ATP tour. Right. So um, with that being said, is um, I mean, yeah, he was so good off the return, so good off the ground. I mean, we have film, and we're trying to teach him how to go to the net. Um a side note, I'll come back to Vince for a minute. We had a we have a film that I used to show at tennis teaching conferences of Lou Anspadia, where we we it was before and after, and it was like okay, this was done in fifteen minutes. You know, we had the counter on the screen and just some ways to change your serve. Now mm-hmm. she um, she also won Orange Bowl titles and played pro tennis. And she played at Duke. I think she started Northwestern both with her sister, and they're both lawyers now, but. Um, with did they learn to be really offensive players? I heard Vince say one time is that there's a lot of things that pros today could learn from the old school of tennis mm. um, as far as going forward. Yeah. But when he won that orange ball, it's both players really, they were losing more on their second serve. That's a big thing is that, you know, obviously most players win more behind their first serve, not always. Generally, it's a safe bet. Okay, they win more behind the first serve. Yeah, but if they if in both players in the Orange Bowl final, they had they were they had a losing percentage behind their second serve. So to me, that's a way to say that's a junior match. Yeah. So even like at Kalamazoo, now the person who just like with the NCAs, um, you know, you think of uh, Brad Gilbert would be a player. I think um, Isner too. They're, they one thing they have in common: they lost in the NCAA finals. But many times the joke is whoever wins the NCAAs won't do too well. <laughs> last, last time the NCAA was played was right here in Lake Nona, five miles from our place. And um, University of South Carolina, a nice player from England, there was more forcing in the women's match yeah. than there was in the women's match. I remember that, yeah. And, um, oh, you, we, we can talk about the pros. You know, if you look at, like, uh, Zareva doesn't force enough, doesn't go forward. Zvera or the, the the younger brother, yeah, Alexander Sasha, yeah. Um, Ken Dryden, hockey player, always says that you, you're most enthusiastic about your sport from the when you first you know, started playing. So, um, the you know the people my age would be thinking Laver was amazing. And, you know, kids obviously aren't going to think that way. But so, like, with computer tennis, I think back so much about the matches I first charted. And someone who used to practice with uh, Clayton Stanley was Julie Scott. Mm. And um, she, yeah, I love that before and after, just as a quick side note, that before and after of her overhead when she was Yeah, of course, tennis and intelligence and applied. And she was in seventh grade. I mean, she was a Ferrari. Mm. She, she could compete, but she had no strokes. Mm. And, um, I mean, it's all documented. Yeah. But, but with that, um, there's a girl, um, 
she was a captain of the Stanford team. And she was sent to me after four years at Stanford to work on her game because she was going to try to play the pro tour. But I remember Julie lost to her six and six. It was a girl from Stanford. Mm. And then they used to have the junior Olympics. And the very next summer, she beat two players from Stanford. Um, you know, if you think you can, you can. Yeah. Um, when, uh, talk about South Africans, Kevin Anderson, um, Raven Klassen from South Africa, told me the story. So Lynette Fetter, South African. So, you know, she uh, greets uh, Kevin Anderson. And next thing you know, young Kevin Anderson is practicing, plays a practice set with Fetter, mm -hmm. and he wins it. And it was in the Miami Open. And then the, the next day he beat Djokovic. Right. So, um, Anyway, I think it's not a matter of just seven six seven six, but then you sit down with the player and go, you know, you could win this thing three and three. Yeah. If now, if you can learn to do this and you can learn to do this. Yeah. Um, more on Stanford, um, like Bill uh, Dick Gould won seventeen titles, so Bill Jacobson's son played at Stanford. You know, he's it's right in the backyard from where he where he was based, uh, where he currently still lives with. Um, but Jake, Dick Gould was a big proponent, supporter of competence. You could change the tactics during the match. So with his LCD screen, you'd be right on the court. Did he use it? His, yeah, part? he. it was part of their program. Yeah. Um, for uh, 10 years, I was in Texas at Tyler Junior College, and I was there during three different coaches. So the first coach leaves, and I recommend – uh, my right hand person to be interviewed. She wasn't interviewed. The next coach leaves. And then I interviewed at that time, my right hand person was Craig Tiley. He wasn't interviewed. And, but for uh, two different times, I was the interim coach. So when one coach would leave mm -hmm. and when I was the interim coach, we charted every match, mm. every match. And, um, you know, in college tennis, you can coach. Yeah. You can coach. So Dick Gould, uh, I think a great quote for CompuTennis is he had four freshmen. And um, I just was reading this the other day. Um, CompuTennis got them to quit hanging around the baseline. That's cool. With, um, yeah, so Dick Gould, I don't care how you get there. You've got to go to the net twice a game. Yeah. Tom Chimington, another coach right in that area, uh, Foothills Junior College. That's where uh, Brad Gilbert and Leo Levin played. Uh, he was a great supporter. Uh, when Bill was inducted into the Hall of Fame, he spoke on his behalf. He certainly, he certainly helped the growth. Um, here's another story. Um, when Bill would chart a match, like say at the Vic Braden Tennis College uh, or the PTR, the Set would be played and people would watch it. And then what do you do? It was so great. You sit down with the players and you'd ask them, what do you think happened? <laughs> and again, very classy guy. And what would, what would surface is they, they had no idea what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Timmy Hurst, we coached him forever. Chad Clark, Chad Clark lived in a neighboring town. Jennifer Roberts, who's now married to uh, Jim Morgett. She started Chad out, but David Anderson helped him the most of that during that time. So Chad was a great player. He played Wimbledon. He played nine months of pro tennis and he had match point to be the main draw at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. um, with um, Chad, he lost to Timmy in this copy tennis workshop match. And um, actually to be fair, it was a pro set, but Timmy won. And then Timmy was just told it's not going to work for you. And because Chad was dictating play mm. and Chad was missing, that's going to happen within 14 under. We mentioned yeah. uh, that in one of our posts, uh, Philip Farmer from Texas, same age, coached the Bryan brothers for a while. And Timmy's father, Dr. George Hurst, brilliant researcher. I remember sitting down and trying to explain, yeah, Timmy won the trophy, the cotton ball, 14 and under back draw. Um, <laughs> and I said, but Philip Farmer, he, he dominated that match. Mm. He was all over the net. He was missing volleys, missing overheads. He was playing a man's game. Yeah. It's like when Jack Kramer percentage tennis, uh, when he became, uh, when he turned pro, he was number one junior. And his father said, 
now you have to learn to play men's tennis. There's a big difference between little kid tennis and big kid tennis. And again, that's, I think, the birth of analytics through Jacobson is so important. Um, Ivan Lendl. Ivan Lendl won a lot more indoors than outdoors. And his service percentage, according to Jacobson back in the day, would vary, would be almost 20% less per serve percentage because he had such a high toss, ball weighs two ounces. And you know, I think when someone's tossing that high, hey, kids, that's not going to work on a yeah. windy day. You better play indoors. Yeah. But again, I think that comes back to, like, say, Federer's stubbornness not to go to the net. Lendl, um, you know, he won everything but Wimbledon. And he even skipped the French to practice on grass. And then we always say, and it comes from Tony Roach, is that he didn't listen to his coach. Yeah. Roach told him, he goes, you got so much money, so you're too greedy. <laughs> you got so much ego. You just got to win, win, win. He told me you should just go forward on every surface year round, then yeah. you're going to win Wimbledon. Yeah. But uh, even his own numbers indicated um, that he was very, very successful. Um, going forward. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's, again, it comes back to emotional intelligence too. Jimmy Connors, I mean, he was always a great player, but he didn't really stand out until he got to the real highest levels. And then, you know, his return to serve was out solid on first serves, but nothing out of the ordinary. But second serves, it was like, who is this guy? Yeah. Because he would, you know, Jacobson term is he would just eat up second serves. Mm. And he would take a second serve and turn it into a plus. So he, you know, you're either hit a hitter or the hit E. So who's in control? And, you know, like taking that return so early and like where that, where does that come from? Hitting on a backboard all winter long, East right. St. Louis, with wooden floor. Um, I think this is an interesting point. In 1978, Connors up for love in the last set, the fifth set against Borg. Mm. And he stopped forcing sat on the lead and people in his corner, Lorne Kuhn and others, they wanted uh, Connors to watch it and he didn't want to watch it. So he finally watched it and he just started screaming at the TV, <laughs> standing up and throwing things. And <laughs> so that um, a few months later in the U S open, you know, he, he dominated Borg and people thought Connors was, was going like this and he's going fight, fight, but he's going like this force, 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 force. go forward. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like Connors, his groundies were so good. You know, Nadal does the same thing. Is they, they really set points up to end the point on one volley. But they, so when you think about, okay, someone is serve volleyer. Okay, they serve, they're in the, the red zone, the backcourt. Then they're in the yellow zone playing the first volley. It's a three-shot combination. So, okay, that's a serve volleyer. A baseliner should be playing the same way, except for they're being patient, aggressive. Mm. Another Jacobson term being patient, aggressive, waiting for the ball to be short. And then, and that's what Connors is so good at, is that taking that approach shot and setting up and knocking off one volley generally. Well, that's the thing with this, with the stats on coming forward, like with Federer, you know, when he was, had such a high winning percentage, but only came in, let's say 17% of the time. But you could also say, well, he was waiting for that short ball, the right opportunity. And it was 17% of the time. So it's, it's kind of unfair to be like, oh, you should come in more when, well, they waited for the right opportunity to come in. Yeah. You With um, Chris Everett, people say, oh, she never came to the net. That's not true, but because if you charted her matches. Yeah. But when you watch someone hit 20 ground strokes and then they finally come in, she could volley. She yeah. won She won Grand Slam doubles titles. But the one thing with Everett is like, okay, She's hitting so many ground strokes. The ratio of balls hit. People have to remember when you get to the net, it's a point ending shot. It's like a basketball player. When you're in the back of the court, it's uh, meditated. It's, it's premeditated play. When you're under the boards, it's spontaneous. And that's the way the play at the net is. If you're a serving volleyer, generally you plan on hitting two, at least two volleys, mm. two shots once you go in. So a serve volley volley or serve volley or head. Yeah. If you're a ground stroker coming in, you should set it up well enough where, you know, you just have to hit one volley. Um, that's where people need to arc the ball cross court. You know, they wait for the, f the short ball. And you can actually, and we, we, we'd probably be better off doing this, is tennis really is not chess. It's tic-tac-toe. 
<laughs> you know, we, we can say, well, it's checkers. Um, there's all sorts of variables, but really, especially great base tennis, working with young players in their formative years, is if people can step inside the court, we call it the offensive area of the red zone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right here, you know, you know this, you, you, you actually indicate what zone the player was in when they you know, won the point. And therefore, it, it tells you what zone the other player was in when they lost the point. Copy and, tennis did that. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it. I mean, I, I mean, I'm certainly am familiar with the products that are out there. I should, we should be more familiar, but you know, the stats and I, um, often after a match you watch on TV, um, I'll look up, uh, the ATP or the IBM stats and it's, uh, it's just not the same. Yeah. Uh, it's not as in depth. Um, and I think of one of our other pillars I mentioned, Jim Verdick, only person I know, only person I know is he would watch a match on TV and he would just chart the whole match. Mm -hmm. Just chart the whole match. So we'll get through a few other ways and ways to chart. Quickly going back to Connor's, you know, watching his match and he's yelling at the TV. So do you think he just watched and went, oh man, I can see that. Or do you think he actually took stats or got some actual data from it? Or is it more of, you know, when those guys, I, I wonder about in the well, 70s. Well, you know, I think, you know, they, I remember, they, you know, I spent stats. a lot of time talking to Steve Denton, who hired me to, help him learn how to, you know, teach tennis. All right. But when you think about teach tennis, there's a difference. You know, it wasn't like I was teaching him to play tennis or coach tennis. I think people have been around the game, like a McKinley or a Denton. They know without knowing. You know, they don't have to start talking to you about the degrees and the dimensions. They've just played and watched the game forever. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Connors' his education, you know, taught by his mother, his grandmother, I mean, it was in his book where he didn't take a set from his grand, from his mother until he went to Kalamazoo in the 16s. Mm. But, you know, he said when he was out in California, he was taught by Pancho Segura, but so that meant he was around Pancho Gonzalez all the time. He said he couldn't take his eyes off Gonzalez. Yeah. And, you know, there used to be a line that you don't hear anymore is that if someone was going to play for your life, who would you pick? And, you know, the Connors would say that, and then, you know, he'd say McEnroe and uh, Gonzalez. And, um, yeah, being aggressive and forcing the match, having the match on your racket. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, I'm going to go for the shot. I don't, I don't want to, it's like, you're going to lose match point. Would you, you know, rather be up at the net missing a volley or overhead or, you know, just in a ground stroke exchange. Yeah. Have some fun, play all over the court. Well, that's where I feel like the, you know, whether it's a junior player that, that has some experience of playing a long time or a pro, I think they, they feel like, oh, I know what happened out there, but they still don't. Jimmy was away from the game for a long time. He starts coaching Roddick. Just, sorry, just meaning but, that, that you yeah. know, they might say, oh, I had 10 double faults, but it's like, no, 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 you had six. Yeah, no, that's you know, true. The story still isn't it's straight. Like I went fishing and it was, I caught a big fish or, you know, the, you know, the ball's out by two inches. It was out this much. Yeah. But when Connors, out of the game a long time, he started coaching, he was calling up Gloria Connors, saying, what should I tell Roddick? And with uh, years ago, um, you think of you used to take an American 22 days by boat to go play Australia. And there was no exhibitions. It was, you know, Jimmy Connors, uh, he would get... Um, suspended and, and he'd make more money playing exos than he would put on the tour. Yeah. Um, but there used to be more sitting around watching people and, you know, people would play all three events. I think the players today are stronger through fitness, definitely fitness through nutrition, but the players yesteryear were tougher. Yeah. Playing all three events and not sit, sitting, you know, not taking commercial breaks, basically sitting down on the changeover. No chairs. Yeah, <laughs> if you exactly, go back exactly. Go back and look at the old good. matches at Wimbledon. Um, yeah. But no, I think coming back to your question is that um, you know Borg, even Connors would know is that he needed to pressure Borg. Hmm. Um, with uh, you know people label Borg a baseliner. Oh, he never came in that. Just go to YouTube. Or just yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, the bad grass. Mm -hmm. um, he was in all the time behind his serve when he's playing Mackinac, like this famous tiebreaker. Shot tolerance. There's just one button right here, SC, stroke count. Mm -hmm. And um, shot tolerance, you know, we quote Ty Tucker, my son Connor played Ohio State and hit the fat part of the court. You know, yeah. Andre Agassi hit the belly of the ship. Yeah. 
the Swedes make it years ago when they had six out of eight guys in the top 10, they make an eight on the tennis court. So you make an eight and you got the four corners, um, you know, on both sides, you know, so it's, you're not, it's not like you're coming up and hitting the, the TV angle. You're not, hand, you're not hitting fancy shots. Yeah. Basic shots win a match. Yeah. Um, great shots make the highlight reel. Yeah. I think it's great. I mean, with this machine, just for anybody listening that statistics have been around for a while. It's nothing. It's not like it's new. I mean, I know back in the day with, with Vic Braden talked about yeah, the old, old very little tennis played tennis, you know, it's just, yeah. a few, it's just a few it's, it's shots. The and, I mean, you know, the, the tennis court's the same shape and there's yeah. still this thing called gravity. Um, I do think that's a problem with the tennis industry um, where I reinvented the wheel. No, no, I actually invented the wheel. Yeah. Before I came along, you know, cars were, they had square tires. Yeah, I think, you know, hey, embrace technology and some of the new great things and now virtual reality, all that kind of stuff. But you got to give credit to those in the past. Shot tolerance with, Segura used to say, and again, I think that's where Jacobson was a player. You know, so it's, I mean, he, besides being an intellectual and, and being in that area in Northern Cal, think tank and being around these, you know, basically inventors, mm. uh, pioneers in the computer field that like say Pancho Seguro, find out what their average is. You know, and if someone can hit um, three balls and they get one more, now they go up to four, they've improved 33%. Yeah. Borg, I can remember people making fun of Borg because at first, you know, he's so young, he's, teenager and he'd be interviewed and you know he didn't speak English very well and people made fun they just didn't understand that he's reading comic books well <laughs> if people have been in another country you know I, I think Americans if they've been to Europe one time they think they're well traveled but when uh, you know it's interesting when um, you want to learn something we had a young girl here this a couple of days ago from Bulgaria and she started yeah. uh, you know I think she was um, you know, nine years old, 10 years old, when she first came to the United States, couldn't speak English. Yeah, two years. And I said, how'd that go? And she said, oh, it worked out fine. They put her in kindergarten for a couple of months and then they put her in the first grade. Yeah. And- you Learn the ABCs. You know, actually with your, when you're around young kids, um, there's no fear of making mistakes. Little yeah. kids don't really worry about making mistakes. You're nine, we're gonna put you in high performance English. <laughs> and- <laughs> I'm elite. Yeah. Um, Arthur Ashe, um, Arthur asked Bill Jacobson to chart the 19, his 1975 Wimbledon win over Connors. Mm. Um, in 1985, I was in Germany and I was a guest of Robbie Seguzo and Roger. Robbie was a, a played doubles. Um, and Bill was there with the Davis Cup team. And I, I can remember after the match, after the doubles match, Becker played with a guy named Maurer and Hans Maurer, I think. Anyway, oh, um, Mark Hamlin, who I grew up with, mm. and then he, he, he got yeah, the bone. He got connected <laughs> in tennis with me. And so he's teaching tennis in Germany. I'm over there working with him. I'm a you know, consultant, Vic Braden Tennis College. And so um, Hamlin is over in the stands and I, waving an umbrella and he's pointing and I thought you know, he's been <laughs> drinking too much German beer. Yeah. It didn't take me very long, but it, it was Gunter Bosch on one side. And every time the Germans were serving, <laughs> they have the little flags, the German flag, American flag. So um, he's standing behind Seguzo flag. And they actually were innovative and they were hand signaling on where to serve. Yeah. Not just where they're going to poach, stay or fake, but where, where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. So this is how nice a guy Arthur Ash is is so I have finally have a speaking part. It wasn't saying anything. I've had a lot of jobs. That's a smart thing that I've done is I've had a lot of jobs where I didn't have a speaking part. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like, okay, if I'm listening to Bill Jacobson talk about stats, I'm in the back room and I'm not saying anything. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I, I stand up and it's in Hamburg and 11,000 Germans are screaming. And, and I tell Arthur that um, they're cheating. They're getting the hand signal. He calls them all over and, I said, why don't you tell them just to do it verbally? So then they, they switch sides 
they actually lost the first two sets and they won in five. But they lost the two, first two sets. The other team knew where the serve was going every time. Yeah, yeah. And now that's that's something where, come back to Warren Pretorius, is where does the serve go? Um, the So Arthur tells him, calm down. They're only cheating on the one side. Well, Tyriac was the or he orchestrated the whole thing because <laughs> yeah, at that, that, that time he was coaching Becker. Tyriac and Velas had bought um, out uh, Becker's uh, working relationship with the German Tennis Federation because of the German Tennis Federation, if they had put, you know, a quarter million dollars, I think it was $300,000 into Becker's tennis. Like we were talking to David Square the other day. He called from Australia and his son, who's grown up in Germany, yeah. with him working in Germany, the father, if he were to play for Australia, they'd have to pay back what the Germans had invested in his tennis. Right, right. So um, long story short is it was, I'm so I go, no way, Arthur. So I just started looking on the stands on the uh, the opposite end. And Jürgen Fossbender, a German player, he was right there. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I stand up and. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, I, I have a copy of it. It was, it was on ESPN, but mm. why I, um, um, a couple of things, uh, get to the war, Warren Pretorius. I, why I mentioned that is that top players are superstitious, um, on various things. But one is top players don't really trust coaching is my opinion I would have because, what happens is the better a player becomes, the more people approach them. Mm. And it starts at the grassroots level. Mom and dad would know that. They're out and their kids becoming pretty good. Right. And some, hey, mer some, like some, some merchant of flesh is, yeah. is passing out their business card. Yeah. And, hey, you know. Yeah, I could really help them. I will, I will take them further than your current yeah. coach. But um, with Warren Vittorius, he told me a story one time where um, Djokovic – is playing Davis Cup for Serbia, and he gets a call like three o'clock in the morning. It wasn't from Djokovic, three or four o'clock in the morning, because the people in Djokovic's camp wanted to know where the Canadian uh, Papasso was, where he serves. Mm. You know, where does he serve at forty fifteen? And mm -hmm. um, Ten, you know, easy. one thing about Bill Jacobson, another hobby of his is uh, historical maps. And, you know, that's where you just have to think about, you know, his mind ran into playing tennis and his background, but, yeah. um, you know, basically mapping where strokes go, you yeah. know, you know, like, okay, the patterns. And that's what I mentioned. You could chart a little kid. Okay. They hit a forehand from this spot and it, it went to this spot, which is wide. And you just start drawing lines. Yeah. And then when you see on TV, they have these fancy graphics. It's, it's not, it's not all that complicated. Mm. Um, Here's another story, the USTA, the United States Tennis Academy. So I went to that program 10 times. I, I worked on Vic's staff in California, but then it, he, at one time he had it twice a year. Then he just changed it where it was once a year. But it was always around Christmas time. It was like from the 26th to the 31st. And there was always close to 100 coaches there. So I take maybe 10 players, 10 students, uh, Tyler Junior College, they're all studying to be tennis teachers. And I took Sam Olson. Sam, I should say Sam Olson and Vic Diamond. And, um, you know, Sam played a respectable game as a teaching pro. Vic Diamond as a high school coach. He played forever and he's, you know, good in the age groups. And so he's mm -hmm. with us. And it's interesting. They were the best players of the, the group I had. Mm -hmm. So Vic asked me, he wanted two of your players will play. And I said, okay. <laughs> it was very, very good for me because um, these guys were backing up. They were both backing up. Um, Sam, kid from Utah, but he did, he's a, a Mormon. He did a mission in, I think, Argentina. Mm. And he just, he just ran back and looped balls. And he's playing on a hard court and Diamond's backing up. So they would go in and Jacobson was very gracious, but guys... <laughs> <laughs> you're running the wrong you're going way the wrong way and then you know Vic asked asked you know started the humor and um said if we went out on the tennis court and i had you guys to point which way the net is <laughs> you think you could you think you could point and, find, and show me where the net is yeah um with 
Um, but no, again, being aggressive, taking the ball early, time and space, yeah, that can be measured. Yeah. Um, distance, you know, from point A to point B, that can be measured. Um, another thought when I think of uh, Bill Jacobson is Roger Feder, and I know you were in the room a lot more than I was, uh, but I've been in the room where he's interviewed numerous times, and he was asked if he looked at stats, and he said once a year. Mm. And he said he looked at stats right before um, the press gathers at Wimbledon. So he just starts looking at him. So the second question, the follow-up question was, oh, your coach must look at him. And he said, yeah, no, we just yeah. go on hunches. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the coaches, the players, they can have a sixth sense. But that's where we've talked about a couple of times. 2017, he started using analytics. And now when he's interviewed, and that's where he, you know, had that great comeback and beat Nadal. Now, when he's interviewed, you hear him say things. I know less than 2% of the time my opponents are coming to the net behind the serves at Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, with, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, I have to go back exactly how he said it. But, it's, oh, it's frightening at this level of play. You know, it's frightening. How, you know, it's it, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, here's one thing on, on Nadal. Nadal is asked how, how to beat Nadal. Mm-hmm. And he goes, that's easy. Never miss from the back of the court and always pressure me from the front of the court. Mm. And you know, people, kids, kids just, you know, how do you beat, how do you beat Nadal? I thought I heard that a little differently another time where he said, oh, that's easy. Just be super aggressive and don't miss. Yeah. With, um, no, I bet the one thing with comment with uh, players, and I think that's, um, Unfortunately, what people hear is that the, the, the press conference where they're asked um, the same question over and over and over mm-hmm. again, and you'll hear, hear them answer it the same way, perhaps a little bit differently. Yeah. But it's really the backstories that become uh, very interesting. With Copu Tennis, uh, Bill Jacobson, numbers for the age groups. You know, this, these should be your benchmarks for the 12s, benchmarks mm-hmm. for the 14s. Yeah. And you should know it's a language. You should know how much you're forcing. We used to say years ago, that kid won't be able to play in the 18s. That's, you never hear that anymore because yeah. they still play the same way. Yeah, right. And we used to hear that that kid's a Finnish player. Now that means they're from the country, Finland. Uh-huh. They, they, don't finish, they don't finish the point at the net. Mm-hmm. Um, with net appearances, I love to know what were the net appearances. And... Um, even though the players are great, they could be greater. And you know, that's where players from yesteryear, um, you know, there's, there's definitely circumstances. One, like the grass, three out of four grandsons on grass. Mm-hmm. Not at Wimbledon now, in, in two seconds, they have three seconds. It's just a matter of just, boom, snap the fingers. It seems like that court is covered with a tent. Yeah. And um, equipment. With. Um, you know, with, with college coaching, um, college coaches are inheriting juniors that play doubles, playing one up, one back. Mm-hmm. So if they started playing when they were 10, so the 10s, the 12s, the 14s, the 16s, the 18s. And it's really, really sad that, yeah. you know, it's almost like people have a plan B. It's like, okay, you're, you're mediocre. You're playing mediocre tactics. Um, it's like in doubles, and then again, compu tennis for doubles, same thing. Is you know how you do on your returns, mm-hmm. how, how you doing on your serve, mm-hmm. how do you do with your first volley? What's your execution rate? Yeah. Um, the many times the players, like say the Williams sisters, playing doubles, superior athletes playing an inferior system. Yeah. When they first came on the scene, especially Billie Jean King said to him, what are you doing? And they, they started going in more because they yeah. had great respect for Billie Jean King. But and they hit swing volleys really when they go in. Just, yeah. So but they, the um, when it comes down to it's confusing, winning's not confusing. It's totally confusing. Um, the numbers like six, three, six, three, the numbers don't that, that, that number six, three, six, three doesn't tell a story. It's like if a kid wins, Six three six three. They they tell their parents. They tell their friends. Yeah, I played well. If they they lost six three six three, they say I didn't play well. But they actually they played the same. Yeah. They just played a different player. They played someone who played a little bit better. 
Um, execution is a great word. Can you make the shot? Yeah. John McKay used to coach uh, USC, the football team. And then he coached the Tampa Bay Bucks. And we coached the Tampa Bay Bucks. They weren't very good. In fact, the fans, they all wore a paper bag over their head. <laughs> and, you know, I remember back when the New Orleans Saints did that as well. But the fans are the New Orleans Saints. We were the, they called them the Aints. But John McKay was asked in an interview, what do you think of your team's execution? And he said, I'm all for it. It's like, yes, we will put them up, the fire, fire and squad, and we'll, we'll just take them all out. Put them out of their misery. But the question, can you make, make the shot? I think one thing about Bill I'd like to mention is an expert, but he stayed in his lane. You know, compu tennis, stats. Um, you know, he certainly... Um, and I touched upon that already. He certainly knew Vic had so many numbers and about forehands and backhands, you know, like you know, how many RPMs does the ball have, you know, revolutions per minute per second, you know, miles per hour, mm-hmm. things that can be measured. Did Bill ever teach tennis? To my knowledge, um, you know, certainly he helped his son out and yeah. when it came down to, I think he taught the world through compu tennis, but I don't think that, you know, but I would be wrong in saying that because you think back, if someone played tennis and they're a college student, you know, they probably, everybody, it's a safe bet that probably everybody taught a little bit, even yeah. if they're just as a hobby, no income, no money exchange, but they're teaching friends, what have yeah, you. Yeah. Um, with, um, but when it comes down to, um, I do think that uh, one of our other, pillars uh, that's really helped with the great base curriculum is Jim Lair. And I did a lot of workshops with Jim way back when. And, and, you know, so he's a sports psychologist and, but people ask him to be a biomechanist, you know, and I think he was very good about that. It was, that's, mm. that's not my area of expertise, but mm. I do think that so many people um, become an expert in one area. Then it's like, okay, now I'm winging it in the other area. And they really haven't done their, done their homework. Mm. Um, why does that happen is they have the credibility and then the consumer, they don't, the consumer doesn't know better. Um, with, um, we talked a, uh, about T charting. I think yeah. it's great to have juniors charting juniors. When you take parents, when you are coaches, people listening, when you take kids on a, at a tournament, um, in many countries, and this, this should happen in the U S you know, I think about Sweden, for example, um, you know, the, the, the tennis courts have the umpire's chair, but it has a big umbrella and a kid, every kid in the tournament has to work as an arbitrator. They sit in this, in the chair. So they have to project and announce the score. Right. And they only, they only overrule if there's a conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, the, but just having kids sit and watch a match. If you go to a tournament, kids don't watch. Mm. They don't just sit and watch. Yeah. And, you know, then if you ask kids, so say they're, they're in the 18s and they're from the inner mountain in this country, they're from the Pacific Northwest, wherever. And you say, tell me how many kids, now they're in the 18s. Tell me how many kids in your age group serve in volley. Yeah. You know, how, how many eight kids in your age group do you know who play? Now you can even ask, play doubles and go to the net. Yeah. I coached a girl who won 10 gold balls. She won one in singles and nine in doubles. And she never had a partner who served in volley. Never had a partner who knew formations. Um, with um, put a clipboard by your TV. Juniors, they should have a clipboard, and there's different ways to chart. Yep. Um, I like uh, a cluster chart, just like a candy bar has a cluster of peanuts. Just draw a, t- a diagram of a tennis court, and you get one of those pens that you just click it. It's red. It's blue. Right. And the red is like a nosebleed. Big, yeah. And just write down the write down the the symbols that you create. Um, with AP is approach shot. When it comes down to um, DS is drop shot, and that's not very difficult to do. Just yeah. go through all the shots and ma- make abbreviated symbols. Yeah. Um, and you'll find that the the, the player. You can have a young 10 year old with you. It's okay. Like you did that today with mm-hmm. a player a little bit older. I like line by line. You get a legal pad. Yeah. And you just, uh, and this comes from Jacobson, you know, you, okay. Number one game, first point. And then you got to either your player is serving or returning. 
And so you, you're going to take care of charting the serve and the return. You know, like with copy tennis, you get really good at it. It's like someone who is learning to drive a stick shift. At first, it's very complicated. There's an extra pedal, and you've got mm-hmm. grind and find where where, where the gears. You know, you keep talking about this letter H, and uh, people panic a little bit. Mm-hmm. And but you get to the point where you, you know you get so you can do it very quickly. Yeah. Now, how you how you how you learn to chart is you film a match, and you have it on your TV set. And you just use your remote control. You stop and you, yeah, you, you pause write it down, you pause, you pause. Yeah. But if it's a live match, then also too, it's a live match. And it's a contrast to styles. If you're charting a match where you've got an attacker against a counterattacker versus you're charting a 12 and under match and it's like, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. And they're just lobbing balls back and forth. Yeah. But I like line by line because then you can... Um, you know, Chuck Creasy used to call it momentum charting. As you see, when it rains, it, it pours. So a kid will lose like six points in a row. Yeah. And they just can't regroup, clear the computer. They make a mistake, short-term memory, and they move on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, and Jacobson was opposed to this, is that the big points. But all points are big. Yeah. Now, you know, when it comes down to, it's like people playing the ad court and doubles going, I'm playing the most important point, but it's, it's the previous point determines whether you're ad in or ad out. Just, you know, like a break point or game point or set point or match point. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to look at how long the match was so you can chart by clock. Yeah. using a stopwatch. Um, there's so many things you to do with a stopwatch. I used to wear a stopwatch and I don't now, but I think having an assistant or two working with me, they should be wearing a stopwatch. I have to let them know, okay? I don't even carry a racket anymore. I do have a little piece of paper and I'm writing things down, but I used to insist that everybody had a clipboard, mm. had to have a clipboard. Yeah. And you know, actually the type of clipboards people should have, if anybody's ever got a speeding ticket and the uh, officer stops them, they have this clipboard where they can open it up. Yeah. And, and when you open it up, you should have charting sheets. You right. should have grip stickers, you should have goal sheets. And yeah, those are great. So. Uh, two pens, I mentioned that. Dot to dot, I mentioned that. So you miss you miss here, and that's where you draw the line. Yeah, and it's like... Good visual. And you'll find that keep, people keep missing wide because they see their target through the net. They don't get the racket below the ball. You know, you ask a kid the, the Braden number of 19.1 degrees, how wide the court is. Okay, point on the line. Now close your eyes, point cross court. 19.1, doubles is 24.2. They're not contact oriented. They don't understand. Yeah. They're target oriented, so they don't get the racket below the ball, and then they pull. So they have a swing that goes like 270 degrees on a 20 degree court, mm-hmm. and they're missing. They're hitting that side tee, or they're missing right around the side tee, which is 65 nine. Yeah. So we got to match up the numbers. I think the, the the science from Braden on stroke production, and the numbers from Jacobson on stats, they they need to be understood. Um, yes. With. Um, Here's a very simple example of charting. Dennis Vandermeer, another yes. South African. Yeah. Now, we've trained a lot of South Africans, but great base. We, we've been trained so. by South Africans, Jacobson and Vandermeer, mm. with, um, you get three people. Now, we do that quite often now with a cell phone. So you have one person feeding, one person hitting, one person filming. Yeah. And it can be done very quickly, and you look at it. What Dennis used to do is have one person feed, and one person, it, has, it hangs on to 10 balls. So the feeder's going to feed 10 balls. So you put a target right here and say, okay, hit a cross-court forehand to this target. Yeah. So you got the feeder feeding the 10 balls. You got the hitter going to the target. And then you have the person right by the target, and they put a ball down right where the ball landed. Landed. Yeah. And people are not close at all. Yeah, they're all over the place. And they're all over the place. Scatter plot. And, you know, that's like coming back to forehands and backhands is people think they have a a great forehand because they're comparing to the backhand and vice versa. Um, summary, I think you got to be managed by stats. The score doesn't always tell the story. Yeah. Anything that can be measured can be improved. Keywords, um, forcing, defense, offense, transitioning from defense to offense. Mm-hmm. The differential. Yeah. Um, the key shot. Um, you know, he, who hit short. You know, yeah. we, we have sentences that come from Jacobson. Um, when you miss, you should be in a point-ending situation. Yeah. 
Um, I think of a kid that I worked with uh, through Richard Hernandez years ago, Jeremy Langer, lefty, talented, hit the ball really well. I think he has the record for most matches won in Indiana. But I remember Jeremy saying, it only bothers me if I miss and I'm not trying to do anything with the ball. And I think that's, you know, so, okay, it's, mm. you, if you're forcing and you make a mistake. Mm-hmm. Now, Jacobson, three shots you shouldn't miss. Returning a second serve, hitting a second serve, and an approach shot. Mm. If you miss an approach shot, you know, you're, you're missing out on reading skills, recognition skills. So it becomes an anxiety shot. Kids a blast yeah. because they, they don't understand the geometry of the court, the zones of the court. They don't have volleys. Yeah, so they don't trust <laughs> the Braden. Is they, don't a, trust they, don't, they don't trust their volley, trust yeah. their overhead. And plus we're creatures of habit. And it's like, okay, I'm going to crush and rush. I'm going to, you know, just blast this ball. Yeah. And it, it's home run derby. And it's their emotional quotient. But you should hit an approach shot with the idea that you want to hit the volley. Yeah. And all you got to do, I, and it's really a, the high end, but if you could win two out of three, it's aggressive air margin. Mm-hmm. And we have to make sure that people understand it's not A-I-R. You know, it, you spell it like in baseball, you know. And you think about other sports. Uh, I mentioned the match with Clayton Stanley and Ryan Simi where his father was a baseball player. Um, a football player will throw the ball three times, a quarterback, throw the ball three times. Three things can happen and two of them are bad, but they still throw the football. Yeah. Um, you you need to be able to take a risk. You know, you need to be able to go for your shot. Mm. Um, Michael Jordan missed more game-winning shots than anybody in the history of the NBA. Right. Um, with, uh, we'll, we'll have one of these uh, podcasts on, on, on Vic. Um, but I do think that um, when it comes down to uh, uh, Bill Jacobson, even that uh, the company that Leo Levin worked for, you know, now it's it's uh, the largest. Um, and what is it? Uh, the number I said or the name? Um, I look it back up in my notes, but um, we're they're the largest in the business of 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 uh, gathering data from sports. Yeah. And um, uh, to me, I think really um, Jacobson with what he did, and I think credit should go where credit's due. I don't think there should be any trying to wow people like um, we invented analytics, you know, that, but I, I really think that he made a major contribution to tennis, definitely a major contribution to the great base. I had compu tennis for 15 years. And to me, I, I feel like I have the eye to, because I've done video work for, for so many years now, mm. but it's no different than, you know, when you're looking at a match and you watch it for a few minutes, you can read the strokes of the match, but you should be able to read the stats of the match. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, it all, it all comes in, uh, even like the personality side of it that we talked about in the last pod- podcast. I think I was listening to, uh, we were on the car ride, we were listening to, Kobe Bryant's interview um, with Lewis House on the School of Greatness podcast, great podcast. And he was talking about how he looked at film with this guy when he first kind of, yeah, if you ever right, and just looked at everything, you know, super slow motion, every little detail broke it down. And he said, you know, we looked at so much film and broke down things, um, all the little things that the game, then live games became slowed down to him. He could see all the different patterns and whatnot just because he had looked at so much film. And I think the same thing goes with looking at video, but also dealing with stats and charting is that when you watch a match live and you understand simple, simple math of the court, the the Vic Braden things we could say, and then also the numbers we talked about here tonight with plus minus IP plus plus all that kind of stuff, that strategy and all that, it all comes together and becomes very simple when you're watching it in real time, it slows things down and becomes simplified. So it's easy to yeah. break down strategy, tactics, all that kind of stuff when you when you we have that language and you have some experience with it. With Kobe Bryant, we just put up a basketball hoop and it's 10 feet and you can adjust it. I'm the best basketball player in the house. Best basketball player, Andy Fitzell. Yep. He can dunk. But with that, uh, Kobe, you know, if your kid's three, four years old, 
they'll have the basket be 10 feet. Be, you know, he says, take two hands, stand one foot from the basket. Yeah. And just do this for months. Yeah. And he goes, once they start making almost all the shots, from just one take, spot. take one step back and <laughs> yeah. now do it again yeah. for, for months. Yeah. Uh, when they're a little kid. It's basics. Um, I think with stats, way too much money is spent on tennis for what people get as far as, you know, information. There's a brain drain. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, it's 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 amazing. Like for you to be at a tournament today and you're charting and people, yeah, that's cool. Because what? You can be at a tournament. Oh. You can you can be the only person charting. Like we said about college kids, we would take the seven and eight. We wouldn't have them be cheerleaders. We'd have them, and that's what Verdict did. You know, and next thing you know is his number eight player down the road a little bit was an All American. Yeah, um, Vince Lombardi. Green Bay Packers, they would win on Sunday and then they would watch the film on Monday and the late Max McGee would come out. He's a real funny guy. And he goes, guys, I thought we won that game <laughs> because uh, in Lombardi was the first one. You know, who's 15? Who's 15? And the late Bart Starr was 15. And Jerry Kramer, um, he was 64. So he, he didn't call anybody by, by names. And those guys were superstars. Kramer was a guard. He throws a famous block in the ice ice bowl for the Cowboys to win. And so um, Jerry Kramer wrote a book, um, Instant Replay. And uh, but when I was uh, a kid in a small town, Sam Volo, Casanova, New York. I was born in Posnia, New York, but then my parents moved south by 150 miles. And we were moving the wrong way for a hockey player. But when it comes down to... Um, Sam Volo was a winning football coach. I saw him at a funeral one time. I said, uh, Coach Volo, why were you so good? And he said, I just loved it. But I'll tell you another reason why he was so good is he used film mm -hmm. and made a study of it. So I used to, once, he, once I was in the seventh grade, so I'm in the same building as Sam Volo, and he was a PE teacher. And he, one time he was also the athletic director and the PE teacher. So what he would do during Monday PE classes is that on a sequence analyzer, he would show his football game from Saturday. Hmm. So if you had a high enough average, you could sign out a study hall. So I would go during my lunch period. Of course, I'd see it in my PE period. And then I would see it during study hall. So for three sessions, he, I'd be back and forth, back and forth. Hmm. And you need feedback. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, pat on the back and, and, you know, it's always about getting better. You know, when it's, you know, parents need to really understand this with your child. If you're really going to be good, it's never good enough. Mm. You know, you play and then you reevaluate and say, yeah. okay, I want to improve. I think one of the best Kobe Bryant's um, is um, if, if you win, it's great. You're going to party and practice the next day. If you lose, you're not going to party, but you're going to practice the next day. Yeah. Either way, you're going to practice yeah. the next day. Yeah, and this and, podcast tonight, you know, you were saying, you know, win or lose, it's both exciting because if you win, you can still go in. You could, you know, obviously it's exciting to win, but you could still find some things, okay, that I could have done better. And when you lose, it's even more so because it's like, okay, wow, I have a lot to learn that I can improve on and get, and get better. That's the way he looked at it and approached it. But I think in closing, um, we have to thank Bill Jacobson. Yeah. That, that with Bill Jacobson, his contribution to what we do is that's why we can confidently say great base is fact based instruction. Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. Right. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I think for the listeners at home, if you're parent, player, coach, getting people to chart, get that objective data, then it makes practice a lot more fun as well because you've got specific things to work on and and can measure it. No, and I think it's like learning learning new things. We talked about musicians, you know, they don't play the same song. I mean, they don't just play one song, they learn new songs. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, they play the same song, they play that maybe the forehands a song, the backhands a song. They play it over and over again, mm. trying to make it a masterpiece and tweaking it and adjusting. But at the same time, you don't play one song. Yeah. And I mean it's really, really sad that kids seriously, it's not a problem to say Point a finger to kid. Unfortunately, you played three years of tennis where you didn't serve volley one time. Yeah. And basics turn into instincts. You got to do it over and over and over again. 
But um, I think if you can just sit down and, you know, we stay away from the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, say it over and over again, don't est- underestimate the capacity of the learner, Yeah, is um, you need to force, you need to take initiative. Um, you know, Wayne Gretzky, um, what's his famous line about, um, you know, you, you, you don't score on shots you never take. Yeah. You know? Can't score, yeah. And so go for it. That Tennis 101. Thanks for listening. Appreciate everybody listening. And uh, if you want to find more about, find out more about charting, we do have some videos, I believe, on Tennis Intelligence Applied. They go through. Yeah, there are. Some, um, some charting. Yeah, so Tennis Intelligence Applied. Uh, but also, we're just like everybody else. We got to get better and we need to uh, do some more work on um, letting people know how to chart. Yeah, we'll make some new videos coming up in the year to come. Find us online, greatbasetennis.com, on social media, at Great Base Tennis. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully Bill Jacobson, you got a lot thank you for your that. efforts. We'll see you in the next one. Adios, amigos. Thanks.